happy Labor Day. Oops. Happy, happy Labor Day 2021. I want to welcome you to our second annual Labor Day with Raising Lily Ledbetter, Women Poets Occupy the Workspace Reading. And uh, I just wanted to, and Sandy is holding up the book. Uh, hopefully all of you uh, have had the book now. You've had your contributors' copies. I have several. Uh, and I wanted to just say a little bit about the anthology for those of you who, whom it is a, a new book or relatively new. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, you know, we're so happy to have you here today. Uh, we did this last year as well. And a few things have changed since then. Mainly we have a new administration, which is great. Um, but a little history about the anthology. Um, in January 29, or tw 2009, I can't even say it now, um, after President Obama you know, signed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act into law, which was his first legislative act, only a few days after taking office. Uh, Carolyn Wright, that's me, and uh, Eugenia Toledo, we began to think about the need for, uh, to hear more from women about their experiences in the workplace. Not just, you know, all the inequities of pay and promotion or, you know, harassment and intimidation, but everything relevant to women and work, including the ever increasing range of occupations uh, that women hold and their representation in this globalized world. Well, since then, since that act was signed, uh, more than 12 years have passed, including both of President Obama's terms and the disastrous regime that existed between 2017 and 2021, right? The, uh, the inauguration on January 20th. This regime, as you know, was devastating to the rights of women, minorities, uh, indeed the entire population of the planet and the environment as well. And of course, we've had the ongoing pandemic, uh, which was worsened by that regime's sabotage of efforts to promote a sane and rational, uh, medically and scientifically based response. And of course, during that pandemic, millions of women left the workspace. So, uh, you know, and because they just couldn't work, there wasn't childcare, they were afraid for their health, et cetera. So um, even though a number of women have returned to work since the Biden administration, you know, took over on January 20th, women's pay has continued to average 77 cents uh, per dollar for every dollar earned by men. And the pay of course for women of color is lower. So this anthology remains as relevant as ever. Uh, this reading though, will be in honor of the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, notorious RBG, as she was called, um, who passed away in November of 2020, uh, alas for the Supreme Court. Um, Raising Lily Ledbetter is the third volume in the Human Rights series of Lost Horse Press, which is a nonprofit independent poetry publisher involved with community outreach and social change through cultural and educational programs. Voices in this anthology bear witness to women's workspaces and re envision the world of work for women. How do we tell our stories uh, in, in poetry? And how do we act as agents of change in these difficult economic times? So I welcome you all, here we are, Labor Day 2021, to occupy this Zoom space with editors and contributors to this groundbreaking anthology that celebrates all of us women in the workspace and men too, because we have a lot of male allies. And, and allies all across the gender spectrum. So I just decided that the easiest thing this time uh, is not to go via the order of the sections in the book as we did last year, but to go uh, just in alphabetical order. So uh, what I will do is I will introduce each reader in, in alphabetical order 
and then uh, we will uh, each that person will read and then we'll go on to the next one and each of you read your own poem and then read one other poem in the anthology of your choice and that works out what sandy you think to about four minutes each four minutes five at the most yeah okay very good well our very first reader for whom I put on my hat <laughs> because she has wonderful hats, wonderful red hats, is uh, Dorothy Alexander, whom I had the privilege of meeting in Oklahoma a number of years ago, uh, seven or eight years ago. She was born in, raised in rural Western Oklahoma out there in that panhandle, right? During the Great Depression. And she attended law school and she returned to practice law in small towns in the region where she grew up. Uh, and so that was um, the, uh, you know, she was, so she began working, oh, several decades ago, 75 years ago, as she said in the, bi in the bio, first on her father's farm, then as a waitress, hotel maid, secretary, tornado chaser for the National Weather Service, court reporter, lawyer, and ultimately judge. Uh, and she retired to Santa Fe, New Mexico at age 84, where she lives with her wife, Davy, whom she married in 2013 in New Mexico because you couldn't do it in Oklahoma. And that, there she works writing poetry, memoir, and letters to the editor. So that's great. So welcome, Dorothy. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you very much. It's good to see you again. Great and it's to good to you. be here. Uh, I'm coming to you from Santa Fe, New Mexico, where we have a glorious uh, opera house on the side of a mountain that's open to the stars at night, and where Ruth Bader Ginsburg came several times. As you know, she was a opera buff, and um, she used to come here a lot. She also appeared at the Women's International Study Center. If you don't know about that, you need to look it up because they do wonderful work. And I had the great good fortune of hearing um, uh, Justice Ginsburg speak there about the cause of women a few years ago. And since I am a lawyer and engaged in the legal field, she was a, especially um, a hero of mine. And so I am very pleased to be here and read my poetry in honor of her. I would also like to thank Carolyn and Sandra and the Lost Horse Press, everybody that's involved in this wonderful cause for doing this and for giving me an opportunity to um, read my poetry. I'm going to read one of mine and then I'm going to read uh, uh, one. I'd like to read one by Mary Ann uh, Zilek. And unless she's here to read her poem. I don't want to steal it from her. So, okay. I don't hear anybody speaking up, so that's what I'll do. My first poem is called Honest Work. I never dreamed of becoming a high-rise, striped tie attorney at law. No, my dreams carried me back to a place like my hometown a version of Spoon River where I solved the problems of farmers, hairdressers, waitresses, old women bamboozled by magazine salesmen, harried housewives trying to escape drunken husbands and their barroom brawls and relentless fathers of children. A country lawyer, a latter-day female Atticus bench. I began by opening a practice in an old barber shop on the main street of a ragged Western town, leaving one barber chair up front visible from the street, bait for lanky farmers and cowboys who favored this manly furniture. Harley Russell, toothless, scabbed and callous, was first to come inside. He couldn't resist propping his manure-stained boots on the footrest, pouring out stories like water from an artesian well. Soon, Angle Park trucks lined the block. 
I tried to follow the advice of an old grizzled lawyer from the next county who said, little lady, write as many $35 wills as you can, take extra good care of yourself, outlive them, then probate their estates. That's where the money is. I drafted wills for relatives, neighbors, strangers who wandered too near the old barber shop. I read abstracts of title, memorized the uniform commercial code, negotiated oil and gas leases, sued magazine salesmen, kicked drunk husbands' asses onto the street. I worked hard, did the best job I could, built trust until I was completely absolved of being female. My second poem is by uh, Mary Ann Zilek. And it, the title of it is A Paralegal in DC. I am allowed to wear red or white, but not orange or peach. I am allowed to eat in the break room, but not at my desk. I'm allowed to date coworkers. I am not allowed to date coworkers. I have become translucent, but I no longer need sunscreen. Spring and summer are rumors seen on a webcam. Only the receptionist has flowers, scentless, orange, and peach. Fresh, not silk. Hands up my sleeves. I wonder where all my time in this city has gone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy to have you here. I am uh, going to go to our next reader, who is Elaine Clift who I have, uh, Elaine, I don't, I don't think we have actually met in person uh, because we've always been on other parts of the country, but I've, I've appreciated your work. Uh, Elaine is a writer, journalist, lecturer, and workshop leader. Her work appears in numerous publications, anthologies, and blogs, both nationally and internationally. Uh, before she became a full-time writer, she taught women's studies and health communication at various colleges in the US as well as overseas, including uh, Payap University in Thailand. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And she has worked nationally and internationally as a program director, public health consultant, and educator advocate uh, for maternal and child health and gender issues. Her books include Around the World in 50 Years, Travel Tales of a Not-So-Innocent Abroad, and the edited anthology, A 21st Century Plague, Poetry from a Pandemic. And both of those sound very, very interesting. Um, so please welcome Elaine Clift. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I really have to say um, that I, I, having done four open call anthologies, I really know how hard it is to do that. And I've just done my fourth with 53 contributors. So it's, it's been a challenge. It's, it's nice to read for a book that isn't my own. We've been doing a lot of Zoom. Um, so I really appreciate being here and, and, and that lovely um, introduction, especially mentioning those two books. So my poem is called Women's Work Circa 1943. Laughter was good, lunchtime was good. Laboring to build ships bit by bit was good. Friendship was golden, freedom was grand. Friday paychecks and parties were swell. They were a sisterhood then, a bevy of beauties in their drab overalls and flowered babushkas. They had tasted the sweetness of self and savored its deep silent pleasure. When it was over, they separated, returning subdued, to their secret isolated lives and longed not for war, 
but for just a little bit more. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks a lot. And since I have been a women's studies professor, I'm going to read Bonnie Morris's poem called Women's Studies Professors Get No Respect. And it starts with a, a several um, a lines in ita italics. Women's studies, you still teach that? Isn't everything like equal now? How come there's no men's studies? Isn't that discrimination? I'd like to see everything human studies and eliminate women's studies altogether. Do we even need women's history in 2012? Hey, is this where all the feminazis hang out? That's the end of the italics. Our lives are still unspeakable. Our her story still scary, plunged in tepid waters of diversity. The first who taught this subject has retired and feminism slowly packs its house, now boxed up, wholly. The language of naming, now a dialect, the spoken words of womanhood soon lost. These days I'm feeling selfish, not shellfish, like the oyster and the crab, just dangerously close to being shelved. As if the women's movement were a book and going out of print and who reads those? Shelf, shelf, shellfish, because I prowl for double X on every bookshelf speaking to my sex. The ones who came before we still ignore or name as strident figures and abhor, unknown as those who opened up the door. I'm underpaid, I'm adjunct, I exist to raise my writing hand up in a fist so that all our her story will not fade in the mist. Thank you so much, Elaine. And thanks to Bonnie Morris as well, who's known as Dr. Bon. Uh, she read with us uh, and when we were at Split This Rock in Washington, DC back in 2016. So it's good to hear her poem again. So let's see, uh, and uh, our next reader will be Stephanie Friel, who I know from the Whidbey Writers Workshop. Uh, she graduated with her MFA back in, I believe, 2008, I think it was. Um, and good to see you again, Stephanie. Um, she worked for 15 years in corporate human resources and then she left the world of that ridiculous bureaucracy to write. She received her MFA in fiction from the Whidbey Writers Workshop, and she lives uh, with her family in uh, Northern California near the coast. She's the author of two short story collections, Feeding Strays, which was published by Lost Horse Press in 2009, and Surrounded by Water, uh, from uh, Press 53 in 2012, which includes a story that won the Glimmer Train Fiction Award. Her published and forthcoming work can be found in magazines such as Witness, Mid-American Review, Western Humanities Review, Quarterly West and American Literary Review, and several others. So please welcome Stephanie Friel. Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to, this is great to be here. I'm gonna read a, a short piece that was, um, that was sort of uh, inspired by working those 14 years for corporate America. Now I work in outdoor education with little kids, which is far less of a paycheck, but far more of heart. So here we go. This is called Removal of Oneself from Corporate Identity. With the jaw of a mountain goat, one of the many managers declares behind the block-wide walnut desk how dark chocolate is simply orgasmic. Knowing anything sexual could be deemed harassment, the women on the other side of the desk, which functions now as a crevasse separating importance from employment, they will titter an elbow and cross short skirted legs. He has that kind of jaw that represents a full cooler of a man's beer or a bucket of flat white paint, something heavy, blockish, exaggerated, thrice broken. This is not a handsome face, but the jaw of the corporation held above the collar of the company 
rising over the shoulders of the department and jutting beyond the administrative assistance. Later, when he leaves for a meeting, his words will be repeated, as in, you, dear, are simply orgasmic. The afternoon will become one of unusual office hilarity. The women will feign bliss while filling out memos, simulate rapture while filing forms, ooze in faux ecstasy while sipping their afternoon espressos. By the time he returns from his meeting, which is most likely a nap or a shopping trip to Big Five, the women are spent having climaxed all afternoon. They will be robotically typing, returning phone calls in patient yet weary voices, shoes off under the desk, toes idly touching each other, jackets rest on the back of chairs away from softly stained armpits. The tray of cookies displays a habsy, torn tinfoil and crumbs. The boss will have missed everything. Thank you. <laughs> And now I'm going to read a short piece that I found in the book by Lytton Bell titled Another Day at the Dildo Factory. I'm going to read this because I always wondered, or I didn't always wonder, but now I wondered where those sort of things were made. So here we go. Another Day at the Dildo Factory. 20 immigrants in 20 hairnets are painting veins on 20 prosthetic penises. The penises have ceased to seem shocking to them after just one eight hour shift, even to the Catholics. And they disregard them, gossiping and chatting amongst themselves, same as if it were only the paper factory or the ideology factory instead. The penises molded in a malleable rubber sway a little when you touch them as if to ask, what are you doing to me? What are, where, where are you sending me? What will I be doing one week from today? What is my purpose in this world? Is there a God? Finally, one worker says to one of the penises, don't ask me, I just work here. I'm only making minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephanie, that was great. And thanks to Lytton Bell who, uh, wrote one of our, shall we say, more, more high, profile, high profile poems in the anthology. <laughs> so we, we got quite a range and uh, you had to have a dildo in there. Uh, so our next reader uh, is Maria Maziotti Gillen. Maziotti, I guess it would be in Italian. <clears throat> Maria Maziotti Gillen, who is the founder and executive director of the Poetry Center at Passaic County Community College in Patterson, New Jersey. She is editor of the Patterson Literary Review and Professor Emerita of English and Creative Writing at <clears throat> Binghamton University, which is part of the SUNY, the State University of New York system. Uh, Maria has published 23 books of poetry uh, recent books include What Blooms in Winter from the New York Quarterly Press in 2016 and a collaboration of poetry and photography uh, with Mark Hillringhaus, which is called Patterson Light and Shadow from Serving House Books. And uh, her website is in her bio and uh, we can uh, uh, put that in the chat here in a bit, or maybe Maria can put it in the chat. Uh, I think I have the file open where I can copy it. But in any case, uh, take it away, Maria. And thanks so much for, for coming here. Thank you, Carolyn. The last time I saw you, we were reading in Detroit. Remember that? It's like, ah. oh, unfortunately, I'm technologically stupid. And I have to read it to you from a hole because I don't know how to adjust this without my assistant. I, I'm going to read at the factory where our mother worked. Yes. Once when I was 17, I visited the factory where my mother worked. It was on the second floor up a flight of narrow, rickety stairs. And when I opened the door, the noise of sewing machines slapped my face. I searched for my mother and the close packed row of women bent over their sewing. The four men picked up 
one of the pieces my mother had finished, screamed, you call this sewing, and threw the coat on the floor. The tables were lit by bare light bulbs, jagging on cords. I had never seen the place where my mother worked. She thought we should be protected from all that was ugly and mean in the grown-up world. Children should be children, she'd say. They'll learn trouble soon enough. We don't need to tell them about it. She did not answer the floor walker. Instead, she bent her head over her sewing, but not before I saw the shame in her face. Yeah. It was, a, it was a, for a college kid, I have to tell you that that was quite a devastating experience. And I, I'm going to have to read another one of my own poems because uh, my copies of the book are all at my office and I'm in a wheelchair right at the moment. So I can't reach anything on a shelf in here. So I'm gonna read you a poem. When the factory whistle blows. When the factory whistle used to blow, the whole town was called to start their day and end it. The summer I worked at Markow Paper Factory, I had to be at my workstation at 7 a.m. exactly. That's when they'd start the conveyor belt. We packed boxes of Christmas, Christmas wrapping paper, slipped, slipped each pattern out of the shelves above the belt and stacking them so they could be sealed in cellophane wrap. The woman at the front end of the conveyor belt was used to piecework, having worked in a factory all her life. I had to run up and down the line to keep them up. The next day, they raised the speed of the machine and I told the woman to please slow down. She looked at me as though I were a slug, her face flat and cold. Come on, college girl, she said, keep up. Keep up. At 12, the whistle would sound for lunch. and We rushed across the factory, the box room where we ate lunch, we brought in paper bags from home. We sat on boxes, ate our sandwiches, wrapped in wax paper on our laps. We had 20 minutes for lunch. We had to allow time to get back to the bell. By 3.30, when the closing bell sounded, I couldn't wait to climb back into my father's car to go home. Something about this place, the dust, the lack of light, seemed to drain the life from the people who worked there. I kept having nightmares about being stuck there for the rest of my life as my parents were stuck in their separate factories, though they never complained. Two of the workers hid behind, hid behind one of the machines to make love during lunch. They were, they were married to other people. One day, the boss said, we're moving you to the toilet paper machine and showed me how to operate it. I had to place my hand inside to pull out each roll of paper after the sharp blade had slapped it off. And I was certain that each day, one day, I, was going to, I wasn't going to be fast enough and the blade was going to slip, slice off my hand. Only after I left in late August and was walking out of the red brick factory did I feel sad for the people who remained while I escaped into my other life of books and teachers and friends and parties and out of the gray dust that covered everything away from the factory with whistles that punctuated their lives. And as I was trying to decide what to read, I realized just how lucky I was to have the pleasure of being a professor, to have the luxury, the real luxury of doing jobs that I really loved, which my parents didn't have. They never complained, but I could easily have gone in the same direction. So I felt as though some magic wand was waved over me that allowed me to escape and to have a job as professor, to start the Poetry Center, to use poetry as my life and to create a life out of something that I really loved. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you, the rest of you, for listening and for being part of this wonderful anthology. Thank you so much also, Maria, that was great. And you know, there's a few other people in this group who've had that same experience of working in factories and then moving to college and having the ability to you know, have real life experience in comparing and contrasting the, you know, the, two, the two workspaces. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm so happy to have for your perspective on this. 
And our next reader is Janice N. Harrington, who is one of the poets I am having the pleasure of meeting here on Zoom for the first time. Um, and uh, Janice grew up in Alabama and uh, Nebraska, so more toward the center and the south of the country. And both of these settings, especially rural Alabama, have figured largely in her writing. Her second book, The Hands of Strangers, which is from BOA in 2011, draws on the work of women working in nursing homes. And Janice has worked as a public librarian and as a professional storyteller at festivals around the country, including the National Storytelling Festival, which must be a wonderful event. Um, storytelling is, is something that is very, I mean, that's what we do as poets, right? Janice is, also writes children's books, which have won many awards and citations. And at this point, she teaches in the creative writing program at the University of Illinois. So please welcome Janice N. Harrington. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this project. And it's a pleasure to meet everyone. Um, I'm going to start with uh, my poem. And if you're following along in your book, which I always love to do, it's on page 168 in this incredible anthology. And it's called Pieta. She stoops, this should have retired aide, in her polished and repolished shoes and white uniform, lifting this fatal shape, the body of a wordless man who only groans, his eyes startled into clear ice, his blue milk skin, blue veined and blue bruised, eases against her chest. His brow leans into her shoulder, his lips press her uniform's rough pleats and leave damp wings traced in spittle above her breast. Though she does not notice and straining bears the weight as the years have taught, her knees bent back, levered into straightness, breathing in, breathing out, muscles tight, she lowers him as you would lower an overfilled basin, settling its shallow wash gently, leaving even the refracted light undisturbed. So a long time ago, um, I put myself through college as a nurse's aide and um, those experiences and experiences of my mother and my sister who often uh, who also worked as nurses aides um, played a part in that poem. I've chosen a poem by Mio, uh, Mia, Mia, sorry, Mia Lennon, Lennon, Lennon. Um, I've totally- I think it's Leonin, Leonin. Leonin. That sounds lovely. I shall practice that. Leonin. Sounds like something you should have an expensive wine while you're saying it. <laughs> Leonin. Very good. And it's on page 174 for those of you who are following along. It's called Nurse's Epitaph and it has an epigram. Soft nurse of dear idea, near me stay. And yearsly absence. She's a diabetic who craves strong sugary drinks, a gaggle of maraschino cherries bobbing to the surface of a tequila sunrise. She once placed a small square transistor radio in the crib of a thalidomide baby. Mongo Santa Maria's congos crackled on the moist pad and through the metal bars, nose hole, eye pit, tuft of hair pulsed in perfect rhythm. Kneeling among the orange vinyl bean bags, she poured cans of vanilla insure into the stomach tubes of hydrocephalics. Frail bodies tethered to helium blown skulls. On weekends, she brought home crippled toddlers and Down syndrome kids with names like Cowboy and Jody. She once saved a dog's life with the Heimlich maneuver. The chicken bone shot across the room and dented a metal cabinet. All those children 
and dogs are dead now. My mother's slippers shuffle across the tiles of my house. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janice. I really appreciated that. And thanks for reading Mia's poem. Two, two poems having to do with uh, healthcare and working those tough jobs, you know, caring for patients and caring for the ill. And we know <clears throat> as this pandemic continues, what, what tough jobs, rewarding in certain ways, but absolutely exhausting in others. So our next reader is not here physically. Uh, she could not attend. Her, her name is Linda M. Hasselstrom, but she sent us uh, a video of her reading her poem. So uh, I believe that uh, our tech duendes here, uh, Don and Kim are going to uh, arrange it that while I am giving the introduction to Linda Hasselstrom's work, they will be able to prepare the video uh, for us to watch Linda M. Hasselstrom read her poem in the anthology. So I will introduce her now and uh, uh, hopefully the tech duendes are working furiously in the background. <laughs> uh, I did send the link. I think you have the link. So uh, for, Yes, for we're that. all set. Okay, excellent. Okay, so Linda M. Hasselstrom, who's another reader I have not met in this anthology, but she, uh, it, you know, is in rural South Dakota. She began working on her family's cattle ranch in South Dakota when she was 10 years old. And she continued ranching there while serving as a full-time resident writer at Windbreak House Writing Retreats, which she established in 1996 for women. And now it's open to men as well. Uh, Linda Hasselstrom is a, an award-winning poet and writer of the High Plains, whose work is rooted in this arid landscape of Southwestern South Dakota. Her website, which is simply windbreakhouse, one word, dot com, provides details about her writing retreats, online consulting, and about her published poetry and nonfiction. So let us watch Linda Hasselstrom's video <clears throat> reading her poem in the anthology, which is Clara at the post office. A contribution to um, a collection called Raising Lily Ledbetter that is focused on the lives of working women everywhere. I would like to read my, my poem in this collection. It's a fantastic collection. You can tell it's full of excellent poems. This is mine, and uh, this poem pretty much comes from life. These are not all, this is a composite of a number of women that I've known, but they are speaking in this poem, and they were all hardworking women. Uh, and what started the poem was hearing one of them defending herself in the post office. So the title is Clara in the Post Office. I keep telling you I'm not a feminist. I grew up an only child on a ranch, so I drove tractors, learned to ride. When the truck wouldn't start, I went to town for parts. The man behind the counter told me I couldn't rebuild a carburetor. I could, every carburetor on the place. That's necessity, not feminism. I learned to do the books after my husband left me, and the debts and the children. I shoveled snow and pitched hay when the hired man didn't come to work. I learned how to pull a calf when the vet was too busy. As I thought, the cow did most of it herself. They'd been birthing alone for 10,000 years. Does that make them feminists? It's not that I don't like men. I love them when I can but I've stopped counting on them to change my flats or open my doors. That's not feminism, that's just good sense. Thanks so much, Linda, in, in, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> at a distance from uh, the high plains of Southern South Dakota, Southeast, Southwestern South Dakota. Um, so uh, 
Linda is not here to read a second poem. So uh, what we will do is go to the next poet who is Dorian uh, Locks, who appears not to have uh, arrived, although she was one of the first to reply saying, sure, I'll be here. Um, and she, everybody got the reminder emails. And, uh, but in any case, uh, I will introduce her and then I will just uh, read her poem. Uh, it is uh, Dorian Lux, uh, as, you, as you no doubt know, is a uh, finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, her most recent collection is Only As the Day is Long, New and Selected Poems from Norton. She's also the author of The Book of Men, winner of the Patterson Poetry Prize, and uh, Facts About the Moon, which uh, received the Oregon Book Award when she and her husband uh, were living in Oregon and teaching there. She is co-author as well of the very seminal and beloved and much used The Poet's Companion, A Guide to the Pleasures of Writing Poetry uh, by Kim, you know, the other co-authors, Kim Adonizio, who is also in this anthology. <clears throat> uh, Dorian teaches poetry now at North Carolina State University in Raleigh and also for the Pacific University Low Residency MFA program. In 2020, she was elected a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. So her poem in the anthology is called What I Wouldn't Do. And for those who like to follow along, and thanks so much, Janice, for, for doing that, for giving us page numbers. But Dorian's poem is on page 29. What I Wouldn't Do. The only job I didn't like, quit after the first shift, was selling subscriptions to TV Guide over the phone. Before that, it was fast food, all the onion rings I could eat all hand, excuse me, handing sacks of deep fried burritos through the sliding window, the hungry hands grabbing back. And at the laundromat, plucking bright coins from a palm or pressing them into one, kids screaming from the bathroom and 20 dryers on high. Cleaning houses was fine, polishing the knickknacks of the rich. I liked holding the hand-blown glass bell from Czechoslovakia up to the light, the jeweled clapper swinging lazily from side to side, its foreign A minor ping. I drifted an itinerant from job to job, the sanatorium where I pureed peas and carrots and stringy beets, scooped them like pudding onto flesh-colored plastic plates, or the gas station where I dipped the 10-foot measuring stick into the hole at the blacktop, pulling it up hand over hand into the twilight, dripping its liquid gold, pink-tinged. I liked the donut shop best. 3 a.m., alone in the kitchen, surrounded by sugar, and squat mounds of dough, the flashing neon sign strung from wire behind the window, gliding, gilding my white uniform yellow, then blue, then drop dead red. It wasn't that I hated calling them hour after hour, stuck in a booth with a list of strangers' names, dialing their numbers with the eraser end of a pencil and them saying hello? It was that moment of expectation before I answered back, the sound of their held breath, their disappointment when they realized I wasn't who they thought I was, the familiar voice or the voice they loved and had been waiting all day to hear. So thank you, Dorianne, that was and she has written a lot of poems about, about her early working class upbringing jobs. So thank you once again. And now our next reader is Octavia McBride Ahabi. Have I pronounced that correctly? 
Yes, yes, you have. Yeah. Thank you. Octavia is from Philadelphia, where she works as a teacher. She lived for several years in Cote d'Ivoire, or Ivory Coast, as we say, teaching at the International Community School of Abidjan. Her work is informed by the convergence of culture and the many ways people move throughout the world. Her poems present human relationships within the context of global inequality and give voice to women who historically have not been heard. African women, women in refugee camps, victims of civil war, women who battle health challenges, immigrant women trying to find a place in their adopted countries. And her poems increasingly address the issues of environmental devastation created by corporate development. So please welcome Octavia to our reading today. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm loving all the poetry, but I have to reach out to Maria. Maria, I love the, um, your poems about your mom in the factory. My mom worked at a factory here in Philadelphia, 22nd and Market, making tuxedos. And as children, getting off of that 10 trolley and you know, going there for various reasons. But it was really a magical place for us because the, uh, the gentleman who, was the, who, you know, who ran the elevator up and down Mr. Joe was an Italian gentleman. It was mainly Italian immigrant and African-American women who have come up from the South who worked in this um, factory. And Mr. Joe was singing these arias, this Italian gentleman, as we gone up. And that was our first, you know, little kids laughing. But as we moved through our musical, you know, um, uh, journeys through school, it was a magical time. And then those women in those factories, they traveled back and forth. Black women going back and forth to the South, the Italian women going back and forth to Italy and Philly. So I really saw them as like, you know, like world travelers, music lovers. Um, and then, you know, later, of course, mom would share some of the, um, the challenges, but um, that really resonated with me, Maria. So thank you for like taking me, taking me back there. That's almost like 50 years ago. Octavia, uh, thank you. I can't wait to hear your poem. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna share two. One, um, I didn't want sex workers to be left out of this anthology and particularly sex workers of um, outside of the so-called, you know, developed world. And now more than ever, we have yeah. first world quote, men going to places, I mean, really exploiting these women. And so I wanted to make sure that um, their voice was included. An old world sex workers wish for the new world patient, pa patrons. I would love to meet you with the sun standing guard at my back, with the belly rounded with food, with my ears emptied of the welling accusations of my glue sniffing children. I would love to mount you against your will, but with your permission in your own alley, parroting the sounds of TB fire chests between the dissonance of malarial moans and birth calls against the leanness of a stunted papaya tree and a lot of sleeping jasmine and homeless lunatics with hunger spreading through your pores with the cries of your own children streaming through your penis. I would love to meet you then. Wonderful. And the second poem I wanted to include, I work in, um, in Philly, this is my 26 year teaching and I'm really fortunate in the last four years, I'm, I'm living in the community of where I, where I teach. I'm in University City and it's a really a wonderful com confluence of communities. But Drexel and University Penn dominate and you have a lot of um, Haitian women who are caring for the children, you know, of our of our, some of our community members. And a lot of these women are, you know, they walk the children to school. And of course I've, I've befriended many. And, and particularly during the, this last earthquake that happened in uh, Haiti. I mean, if you can imagine you are here laboring and your children are someplace else and back in your home country. So um, this poem um, is inspired by that. Where my birthmark dances. Now the narrator is a child who has been left back in Haiti and she is pleading for the, to the children who, are, who her mother is now caring for in Philly, hey, this is my mom and I want you to know who she is. 
My mother battled waves as, as tall as a thousand ice cream sundaes piled high to be there with you, to push back the hair from your face so your eyes unobstructed could dream big. Wearing a pink dress pattern with rainbows, smelling of, I'm sorry, wearing a pink dress pattern with rainbows, smelling of mothballs, she left me under the guard of a mosquito net perfume with insecticide and the salt of her own tears and the month of May when the ocean felt young and full of itself. From the harbor named Peace, she boarded a boat with the madness of the history of Haiti holding her hand with its boogeyman pushing her to you, with her fear eating the ocean's confidence. On the eve of the season of rain, when mangoes fall to the ground, dwarfed and dead, offering only omens of discolored hair and imminent exodus, my mother boarded a boat made by the hands of despairing fishermen made from my favorite tree, the one I always swung from to kiss the sky. For shield to thwart the appetite of hungry sharks, for a bomb to soothe the bloated anger of the ocean sadness, she used her faith in Mami Wata and lesser gods so she could ride you on her shoulders and you could imagine you were riding on the shoulders of the sky. My mother drank the sea salt after the sun had dried her brain, after her body was numb by the vastness for her own desire for me, opportune, a tea fleur, to eat, to laugh, to grow into ideas. Though you were brave, a believer in dragons and dinosaurs, a follower of their messy intrigues, I will spare you the whole truth of her journey to you. She lives under your city, called by names that aren't her own. Call her Prima when she steals a nap by standing on swollen feet, her toes dreaming of the promises of warm sand. She dreaming of me and starching shirts and ironing gloom and wiping the counters of someone else's life. Call her Prima and look for her smile. She, my mother, is there with you, perhaps under the bloom of a big hearted magnolia tree while I am here in the city of the sun with no protection, eating the bark of our sacred trees. She's singing her Creole songs to you, ones meant to lull me into a labyrinth of daydreams. After she tells you our stories of naughty spiders and the walking dead, of lower spirits and of the people she loves, kiss her for me on the spot of her cheek where my birthmark dances. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Octavia. Wonderful to hear you, wonderful to meet you, and wonderful to hear your poetry. So thank you so much. Um, our next reader is Elaine Sexton, who I also, oh wait, did we meet? I can't remember, did we meet at AWP? I think we may have. Uh, but Elaine has, uh, has been holding executive positions in magazine publishing throughout her professional life, most recently as senior editor at Art News, so wonderful magazines in New York. Following this career, Elaine established a private practice uh, of curated workshops, and she established a micro press called To Horatio, uh, in, in, she has co-edited a chapbook anthology of poems written during, but not of, the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I will get that uh, link for you and put it in the chat. It's in a, I'm not going to try to read the, read the whole URL uh, over, the, over the Zoom. Um, and Elaine's fourth collection of poetry called Drive will be published by Grid Books in 2022. So please welcome Elaine Sexton. Thank you so much. Uh, one second. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for your introduction. And um, I just wanna say um, it's such a labor of love to do these anthologies. So um, thank you and the co-editors and the publisher. And I wanna also thank Sandy for this platform that she created 
so many, I've been to so many readings and it's just so generous to host us. So thank you for that. Um, I also wanna just thank everyone for coming and I feel so accompanied to look out in the audience and see people from the anthology, some who aren't reading, but are like Susanna Case and Grace Bauer, both are here um, supporting everyone in the anthology. And so thank you for coming. And I also wanna point out that two of the co-editors of that anthology with me, Joan Capello and Jennifer Stewart Miller are here today. Um, so thank you for all, everyone. I wanna give everyone some credit here. I'm gonna read the poem in the anthology called Class. And uh, I don't know, that needs no introduction. I, and I'll, well, I should say also the structure of this anthology is lovely because I'm in a section called um, Entering the Workplace. And so the, there's sections about some place in the you know, spectrum of wor our work lives. Uh, they're, they're put together by sections. So this was my first job, I'll just say that much. Uh, my first job for pay. Uh, class. I lasted three days minding a child at the beach club on a thin strand of sand where my family lived but did not belong. I took over the job my sisters had before me, my sisters who sat every summer gladly reading books, getting tans, earning money for college. On the second day, I knelt by the, I, I knelt by the pool, the North Atlantic in sight, the Isles of Shoals raised clearly in the distance. I watched a girl not much younger than I swimming laps. The, beach, the sun bleached the water in the pool, licking its sides the way my soft drink licked my glass. Idle, like the idle rich parents at the bar, I watched this girl as if reading would be stealing the attention they paid for. This was my lesson. Back and forth she swam. Back and forth I weighed belonging and not belonging, the salt water always free, the steps to it already mine. So um, I wasn't able to get to my workspace where my copy of the anthology is. So I don't, I can't read a poem by another person. I didn't have it with me. So I'm going to read another poem of mine. Um, and I do want to honor uh, the great late poet Phil Levine. The first, the first two lines of my poem kind of borrow from his wonderful collection, What Work Is. And, um, and I also want to thank um, Octavia and Maria and a few others who honor their mothers in the poem. And my mother makes an appearance in this poem. And what would we know about work if we didn't learn it from our mothers, really? So, um, okay. And then one more thing, this poem is inspired by seeing an art installation at a, a Whitney Biennial, a couple of Whitney's back, like three or four of them back. Evidence. I thought I knew what work was. I thought I knew what work was before watching an artist make work in a gallery, watching a video she made of herself knocking down a fake wall in a fake sheet rocked room. One she walled herself in, wearing a red satin dress and high heels, using a sledgehammer to get out. Her fake manual labor making me sweat, making me mad, making me self-consciously watch the museum guard silent at his job, watching me, watching her, work at her craft. I thought I knew artwork was work at the time, but just then my dead mother entered the room wearing a blue satin dress she stitched before I was born, the one she worked to construct, learning to sew to please my father. He sent her to school to learn how to mend, to keep house, to cook, her own mother too poor and beleaguered to teach much of anything but honesty, an honest day's work. And she stood there watching the guard, watching me, watching this artist make art, all of us working at watching her knock down a wall, one she made for herself. The only other sound in the room was my blood knocking arteries, banging their cavities. That was all, and an occasional cough from the guard. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Elaine. Thank you. That was that was wonderful. And I love that image of of the woman knocking down the wall 
a fake wall, right? <clears throat> and uh, what what collection was that in? Uh, that's a great poem. Um, that's from Current Blue Prospect Refuge. Wow. Um, so thank you, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, and our final reader, we have actually reached our final reader, who uh, we are sort of at the final poet in the reading, but we've also uh, a poet who is coming to us from the end of the world, as, as it is called, El Fin del Mundo and El Sur de Chile, the uh, south of Chile, which has always been called by Chileans, the end of the world. Uh, and so Eugenia it has managed to patch in from, let's see, are you in Temuco or Pucón or far away? <laughs> Good and, afternoon, uh, Caroline. Hola, yes. Carolina. Nice to see it, you. Uh, it, it, from Temuco. From right Temuco. Right by the okay. Paulo Neruda's museum, where right. we live. Right. We have a, oh, an wonderful. apartment that you know. Yes, well. yes. The and, apartment uh, that overlooks, it overlooks that wonderful National Railroad Museum uh, there in Temuco. So I'll give a little bio uh, for Eugenia, who was born in Temuco, Chile, in the south of Chile. Uh, she grew up in the same neighborhood as Pablo Neruda. She completed her higher degrees in uh, Spanish language and literature. And uh, she came to Seattle for doctoral studies after her university instructorship there at, at, I think it was Universidad de la Frontera, or was it? Uh, uh, it was called at that time, uh, yeah. Universidad de la Frontera. Today is Catholic University. The Catholic University. Yes. So yeah. her, Eugenia's job was terminated uh, after the 1973 military coup, when, of course, the uh, right wing, you know, uh, <laughs> hacks who Pinochet appointed um, you know, basically took over all all higher posts and were eliminated anybody who might have had any possible affiliation or sympathy with the government of Salvador Allende. So in Seattle at the University of Washington, Eugenia received an MA and PhD in Latin American and Spanish literature. And uh, <clears throat> she stayed in Seattle to work and have a family, her son, and she has published several books of poetry and a creative writing text in Spanish, uh, which is a wonderful book to use. It is the, it is the poet's companion for uh, of course, the Spanish speaking of world. Yeah. Um, and her bilingual sequence of poems, Trazas de Mapa, Trazas de Sangre, Map Traces, Blood Traces, which was right. published by May Apple Press. Thank you for holding it up which uh, was written uh, after a return visit to Chile in 2008 with yours truly, Carolyn Wright, and we translated, we translated it together. And it was a 2018 finalist in poetry for the Washington State Book Awards. With her husband, uh, Eugenia divides her time between Temuco and Seattle and has been more recently in Temuco, although we're hoping oh, yes. to have you returned physically in person one of these days, but it's so one wonderful to see you now. Or so the next I'm day. Ask, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, I'd like to have you read the poem first in Spanish, yeah. Eugenia, and then I will read the English from the yeah. anthology. Okay. Thank you so much for your words, Carolina. Um, this anthology is very dear to to me because we worked together on it. And I still remember the days we spent at the cafeteria reading the poems and then I had to come to Chile and I've left you both with all the work behind. And it's, it's good. It's uh, the subject, the themes are very important even today. They were at that time, but today, and imagine in my country, in Chile, um, last time we come, came back here, 2019, we have big uh, social uh, crisis 
and women were in the street. And um, then myself, this anthology is a seed because I continue working with women here, all age, all ages, no? And in fact, here at the Museum of Pablo Neruda right now, I have with three other artists, an exhibition about the women that has been dead in La Araucanía, in this area, in this zona, 56 women since 2000, I think it's 12, maybe 12, 14, 2014, something like that. Um, this poem that we translate stories of women talk about what I and Caroline saw, what um, very low class, very poor women will be doing in Chile. Right now, it's even more uh, desperate, the situation for women. We need to add the, add the domestic violence. Relatos de mujeres. Desde el margen, desde la verja, como mariposa cenicienta, pasé por tu lado. Sentada en la puerta de tu casa, odiabas el aire como gata anciana, correteando las calles, tocando el timbre en la puerta del lugar donde laboras. Te vi en el fondo de un patio, lavando ropa a mano en una batea, pidiendo limosna entre los autos, sorteando esos rotundos oleajes, tu hijo en brazos magnificando la pobreza. Te vi barquera de la noche, fulgor en las espuelas de tus tacones altos, con voz y pancartas protestando, enarbolando la petición y tus ojos en la huelga. Te vi comprando ropa usada, como si fueran ambrosolis en tu boca. Te vi comprando ropa usada, te supe trabajadora con turno de 12 horas en el frío de la pesquera y empaquetadora. Sé que te encontraron muerta. Tu valor es igual al de un gorrión. Y sé que has perdido la sonrisa mientras haces todas las preparaciones para la vida y la muerte navogando este río lleno de sedimento, herido en cada orilla, en búsqueda de un puerto de luciérnagas. Thank you. Gracias. Will you read it uh, for me in English? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, I, gracias, I have Carolina. it right here. I'm yeah, going to your read translation. it in English. Yes. yes. And this was, this was the translation of what Eugenia just read, <clears throat> her poem, in Spanish, Relatos de Mujeres, and here it is in English in the anthology, and it's on page 23 in, in your copy of uh, Raising Lily Ledbetter. Stories of Women. From the margin, from the window ledge, like an ashen butterfly, I went by your side of the street sitting in the doorway of your house. You are sniffing the air like an ancient cat, roaming the streets, ringing the bell of the place where you work. I saw you at the far end of a garden, scrubbing clothes by hand in a wash tub, begging between cars, dodging those inevitable swells, your son in your arms, magnifying your low degree. I saw you navigating the night, sparks rising from the spurs of your high heels, protesting with voices and banners, brandishing your demands and your eyes in the strike. I saw you buying used clothing as if it were hard candy in your mouth. I knew you were a worker on the 12 hour shift in the chill of the fish processing and the mm. packing plant. I know that they found you dead, worth less than a sparrow. And I know you have lost your smile while you make all the necessary preparations for life and death, sailing this river full of silt, wounded on every side, seeking 
a port of fireflies. That was beautiful. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Eugenia. Gracias, you. Eugenia. Gracias a ti, querida. <laughs> So um, we have reached the end of our, our series of readers. And, and Sandy, uh, uh, sh what, uh, what next? What shall we do? Shall we, do we have time for, we have some time definitely for conversation. Uh, any, other, any other poems? You know, I know that this is, sometimes we like to kind of roll with the flow and, um, you know, we have a little bit of time and I know that there's a couple folks in the audience here in Zoom with us. And if I would love to, in, uh, I would love to invite them to read their poem if they, if they would care to, we have a little bit of time. I think it would be, it would be grand. So um, let's do that. And then I'll come back with just some closing remarks and let y'all know what's coming up for the rest of the month of September on Cultivating Voices. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, let's see, I know we have, we have Grace Bauer is here. Uh, I believe Grace is here. I saw her name. Uh, let's see, is Grace still here? I've got, uh, and uh, we also have Susanna H. Case, who, uh, who uh, are, you know, thank you so much for attending. Uh, and let me see, uh, is, I'm not sure Grace is still here. Did anyone see Grace? Um, I think Grace had to leave. Grace mentioned she had to leave about an hour in. So I don't. Ah, OK, OK. Uh, so so Susanna is here. Susanna, would you uh, would you like I think Susanna has has stepped up and I think she may be going to get her copy of the anthology. <laughs> Yeah. I'm yeah. looking for it, so maybe I need to pull it up on my computer and somebody else should go first. <laughs> ah, who else? Uh, anybody else here from uh, from the anthology? Let me see. I'm I'm just happy that that others have uh, have uh, have arrived. Um, your poem is on page 27, uh, Susanna. It's called Broads. Which yeah, I'm um, looking for my... <laughs> oh no, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry to catch you. We're catch you people all on hard. the spot. That's what happens when. Yeah, that's what happens when we uh, go rogue. Again. Yeah, well, um... <laughs> I have yeah. a fantastic poem right here. I found it. I found it. I found it. Oh yay! Okay. Oh wonderful. <laughs> yeah, and you're on page uh, page twenty seven. So okay. there you go. I remember it was it was a really tough choice with this poem between this one and and another one uh, that was so interesting that would have felt that would have fit in the sciences section, uh, but we decided on this one. So I don't remember what else I sent, but this oh, is, yeah. <laughs> but this is broads and there's an epigraph at the beginning. If we could just get rid of those broads, we'd have it made. And that was said in 1983 by the Arizona Department of Public Safety, by an Arizona Department of Public Safety officer. And uh, you know, this is um, about the, um, the strikes and the um, conflict over copper in Arizona at that time. 400 troopers, seven units of the National Guard. No one thought the strike would last years. The 1st of July, the 5 a.m. shift, and soon desert summer will again scorch into bones. Broads outside the house lock traffic or tear gassed. When paychecks vanish, the pickup truck, the striped couch, broads always show up to pick it past the heaped sand blockade discarded at the gate. Wild-eyed broads, scar-faced broads, fat broads, skinny broads, a mile long line of broads, male scabs pulling down twill slacks to show broads what they lack. Their pit work, broads using a jackhammer cleaning out the stack, broads in the arsenic holes, skin turning green where the paper coverall rips. They can do heavy lifting too. Broads outside the house, 
without male permission, as if they were hookers without morals, without muscle, as if each were nobody. Wow. And, and you, have a, you have an epigraph also for yes, that poem. Yes, I do, yeah. um, which I'll read. In, 1983, in 1983, Arizona was the site of a copper mine strike in which the management of Phelps Starge Corporation decided to try to break the union, which had a number of women members who took part in the worker resistance. The strike lasted nearly three years and Phelps Dodge succeeded in decertifying the union, which was a significant defeat for the American labor movement. Soon after the union was broken, copper prices soared and so did Phelps Dodge profits. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And of course that in the early eighties, that was as the so-called Reagan revolution uh, was gathering momentum, and of course, we know, we all know about the uh, air traffic controllers union that was totally destroyed when Reagan just unilaterally fired all of the uh, you know air traffic controllers, and you know it's been but, down. But, I, but I have read that now um, since the pandemic, there is increasing support for unions. So that's yes. one yes. positive thing to yes. come out of that. Well, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Muchas gracias. Uh, we've been here for our second annual Raising Lily Ledbetter Women Occupy the Workspace. I never can get the angle of the books right on Zoom after two years of doing this. My apologies. <laughs> We featured today just an absolute powerhouse of women poets from this spectacular Lost Horse Press anthology. We were also joined by two of the editors, but I want to acknowledge the, all three of the editors are uh, guest co-hosts for today, Carolyn Wright, ML Lyons, and Eugenia Toledo joining us today from Chile. And I want to also say what a gift it has been to welcome the poets who read today from the anthology. And we heard today from Dorothy Alexander, Elaine Clift, Stephanie Friel, Maria Maziati Gillen, Linda Hasselstrom was our video presentation of the day. Janice Harrington, and we heard a poem from Dorian Locks, Octavia McBride, a Habe, Elaine Sexton, again, co-editor, Eugenia Toledo, a reading in her home language, her poem, and reading the translation, Carolyn Wright. Everyone, let's just take a moment to, oh, and we ended with an impromptu reading ah, of the poem Broads by Susanna Case. Thank you, thank who you. joined us last year in our, it wasn't annual then, our first reading of from Raising Lily Ledbetter. Um, I wanna just encourage folks, if you would to take a moment, let's unmute and, and give each other a, kudos and appreciation. What a great reading and so glad to be able to bring it to you all today here on Labor Day in the United States, uh, where I am also a proud union member of our faculty union and uh, highlighting all the aspects of, of, of women in the work space. Well, I want to also just remind you all that Monday is not our usual day for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. We usually join you on Sundays. Uh, and next Sunday, we're back to our regular schedule with our first new book showcase of the month featuring uh, Lori Wilson from West Virginia, 
Darla Himalas from Philadelphia, one of Octavia's neighbors. Uh, Grace Cavalieri will be joining us from Maryland and from Scotland, Kenneth Stephen. And then feel, um, uh, get your poems ready for September 19th when we will return with our wild card open mic, which means your chance to be the feature. And we'll close out the we'll close out the month with Carolyn Wright with your new book. Yay! Claire Kelly will be joining us from Canada. Jim Sealar and Marge Sizer will be joining us from Nebraska for our new book showcase, our final new book showcase of September. We always appreciate being able to provide this virtual venue with such a great audience here live in Zoom and on Facebook Live. For, um, for our readers and our members, we've just crossed the 2,900 member threshold of folks worldwide who post uh, weekly, daily on Facebook and join us for our weekly reading series on Sundays here on Cultivating Voices. Thank you everyone and thank you for those of you um, watching live on Facebook as well. I want to also um, remind you that we could not do the program, at, of course, at all without our, I love to use your word, Carolyn, whenever I can, intrepid Don Krieger and Kim Ports Parsons for their support, uh, their technological and uh, graphics support and, Particularly, uh, you know, I, I found it no surprise that, that our reading today uh, landed when the news of, um, of the Supreme Court uh, failing to really do its work uh, happened here in the United States. And, uh, and um, particularly con considering the work that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had done and her connection, um, her deep connection to the Lily Ledbetter case. You can read about it in the introduction to this uh, powerful, powerful anthology. Uh, so I'm very, very, uh, I, while I'm not glad that the two things coalesced, I'm grateful that if they had to go the way that they went this past week, that, um, that we were able to bring a reading to folks that um, highlighted, while, highlighted why it is so important to remain uh, vigilant, engaged, mm -hmm. and um, connected to the political landscape uh, as fraught as it is with, uh, as fraught as it is with deep, deep struggle and to continue to bring the voices of of those who uh, are struggling to maintain their rights to the forefront. And that certainly was the case of Lily Ledbetter when she brought her case, um, uh, when she brought her original case that made its, all, its way all the way to the Supreme Court uh, during the Obama administration. As I like to always say uh, at the end of the readings, our humanity really truly does depend on our deep listening of one another and Never has that, never has that been more true than as we've been doing the series for this past year and a half. So everyone, please take care of yourselves this week. Take care of your beloveds. And of course, do what you do so well. Keep writing. Sandy and Owen, thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Week. Oh, and I, I posted in the chat, if anybody's interested, I posted the link for Raising Lily Ledbetter, the anthology. If you want to look at it online uh, and acquire a copy, you can do so. Uh, Christine Holbert, our editor, was going to join, but she's in the process of moving from Idaho to Spokane, Washington. But uh, if, you, if you wanted to order an anthology, you can do it online and she will send it to you. Yep, we've so, been posting the links during the reading. Mm -hmm. So please do, um, please do pick up a copy of the anthology. As I said to folks, I've had it behind me sitting, it's going 
It's going, I, I pull it off my shelf often and I have it right back there always there in my little cubby um, because I'm always referring to it. Yeah. Uh, please do support uh, Lost Horse Press, all the poets that you've heard here today. And we'll also be posting the link again tomorrow um, uh, as we always do the day after a reading, we repost the link to the reading. So everybody have a great rest of your Labor Day. Um, and, and I'm so appreciative of everyone joining us and we'll see you next Sunday. And Dorothy, thanks for getting your red hat. I love it. <laughs> okay.